dear son let us pray heavenly father it is truly a blessing to be here among the children of god saints whom you have delivered father god calling us out of darkness into thy marvelous light knowing that it was you father god who did it all and we're just so thankful for you sparing us when we were your enemies drawing us unto your only begotten son the only savior for it is written neither is there salvation in any other for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved now as we have assembled ourselves here on this lord's day we pray and ask your blessings upon our beloved pastor as he has double duty today to do sunday school and the worship service we pray that you would give him a double portion of grace heavenly father and strengthen him through Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior, to teach and to preach the word of God in the power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit of God. And then give him the energy and the strength to do what he has to do after church service to support his family for we ask these blessings of you upon him and upon us. Give us ears to hear, spirits and souls, to be doers of your word and not just hearers only, deceiving our own self. We ask these blessings in Jesus' name and for your sake and for your glory and our good. In Jesus' name we pray with exceeding thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Oh, beloved, you, you have your Bibles. Would you join me in Acts chapter 16? On any given Sunday around here, it is Resurrection Sunday. However, within the framework of that thought, I have designated today as Salvation Sunday. Salvation Sunday. year to date that's okay we don't have time year to date no one has walked this aisle to surrender their will to the will of the I am that we are moving into another quarter before too long. And that happens to be our lot. We have <clears throat> missionaries 
that we support with pennies on a dollar compared to the grand scheme of missionary support. Missionaries in Brazil, Ecuador, Hong Kong, Mexico, Nicaragua, and Ukraine. Periodically, we receive emails informing us of sinners hearing the gospel and being saved. Churches being planted and established. We have a mission field also within our own homes. For some of us, we have those who unfortunately have yet to surrender their life to Christ. And within our families, friends in our neighborhood and communities. But so far, no one has said anything about anyone being saved with all of the preparation from one Sunday to the next and Wednesday night and all of the resources that have been made available. And I know what you're thinking, brother, Salvation is the work of God. Well, that's true. But we sponsor missionaries who go, leave family and friends and possessions to carry the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I don't know how you would respond to smelling smoke coming in through your ventilation only to discover that your neighbor's place in which they live and be that whatever it, they live, apartment, condo, house, only to discover their home is on fire. And then you discover that your neighbor on this side and behind you and in front of you it would be hard to function in the kingdom of this earth, the kingdom of men, if that was the case. But in a definite sense, we do have those who are near us who are lost. And they don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. Original sin was not there fault, but them hearing the gospel and responding to it will be what they will be judged on. I want to take a few minutes during this session and then when we come together again to deal with something that perhaps you haven't given a lot of thought to. Typically, when we come up on people and when we're thinking about evangelism, we will ask them whether or not they are saved. But I don't necessarily see that in the scriptures. I see a presentation of the gospel in those who hear the gospel. They enter into what I would call in Charles Collier notable professor where they are brought into a dialogue with God. Pastor Cotman, you mentioned the other week about it was said that we need more application in our preaching. And I agree with that, but if the truth be told, application means God is speaking to you and God is speaking to me. When God says, thou shalt not or thou may, that's applicable to who? To me. No, what I would believe that we really need is more of us 
who are filled with the Holy Ghost of God, in whom God has approved of how we're living before him, that we allow the Spirit to take the Scriptures and to bring sinners into the presence of a thrice holy God. Whereas he told Timothy, this is Paul, preach the word. The word will make its own application. So in Acts, Peter said, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Paul took it up in Romans. And he said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel, and don't miss this, the gospel of peace. Bringing glad tidings Of good things. But you want to know the truth? Isaiah went on record saying, but they have heard the gospel. They have heard the truth. But yet they have not believed the truth. I am more convinced than ever that the greatest mission field in the Western Hemisphere is gatherings such as this. All across the fruited plain where the church is doing the church business of coming together as we are instructed not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. There are those who have assembled with the church and they're not saved. What brought on this teaching for this hour in the middle? I was listening to a broadcast out of Florida, a young pastor, and one of his in one of the churches, pastors was doing a Bible study. And he said, we just baptized a lady who was in her 60s, been in church all her life. What was she thinking all of that time? She was apparently had her mind set on sin, and maybe she believed that some experience that she had as a youngster, we write it up in the obituary like this, and he or she joined the church at an early age. But none of that saved. Because the song says, Jesus saved. And if that was true, and it was in a church that I know they're set on preaching and teaching the word of God. It's possible that that could be the case here. And for those of you who have been listening and listening a long time, and you've been in the church a long time, Because one of the things that doesn't happen in the church is this. But it happens with pastors. 
Let me set it up by saying this. No church is going to bring in a pastor that they know nothing about, one without his resume. You know, if they decide that they want to and are led by the Spirit of God to interview this man, you want to know what they really want to hear? Is his conversion experience. But I grant you, as you sit out there, that when you came forward in a meeting or wherever you were, you, no one brought you back into a room afterward and inquired into, do you know what you just did? Do you understand? In most cases, that never happened. But that is a requirement for pastors to lead God's people is to set for his conversion experience. But if it's good enough for the man who's going to, and the men who will lead God's people, we ought to be inquisitive with those who made a profession of faith to sit down with them and ask, man, tell me what happened. Give me, I want all of the details. Please do tell. Because there have been those who've made a profession of faith in this ministry. Since I've been here, they're nowhere to be found. Some of them, they're not in no church at all. But maybe some of that could have been identified. When maybe we base the standard of salvation on you keep coming back. Do you know the folks who keep coming back to an assembly who are not saved? Apparently, this lady was in the church for the better part of her life. Now, I know she was between a difficult place. Well, no, I've been here all these years. Or maybe she came from somewhere else. She didn't consider, what are they going to think back at my home church? See, the only reason why anyone is saved is because of Jesus Christ, God has provided such a salvation. But I hear in testimonies, I hear when folk talk, why they gave their life to Christ, it has something to do with someone else. As my old pastor would say, and he was an old man, in fact, he was younger than me, he said every tub has to sit on its own bottom. You cannot base your salvation on what God did for someone else and then you say, okay, no, you have to become broken. In Matthew, it talked about you and I, and he's speaking to Israel at that time, but you have to fall on the stone. The stone is Jesus Christ. You have to obey the gospel and be broken. Most of the folk I know are not broken. They still mean as a, oh God, and they still as chinchy as ever. And they don't have anything really that they want to give out except <coughs> opinions. I'm wondering. And I didn't want to do this to you. I didn't want you to have to meet with me since y'all know what I do afterward and going in. But to, to, to ask all of you, when you get off, I want to meet you. I want to hear your testimony experience. And I sure hope it wasn't, as one fellow said, that you didn't join God's Navy. What do I mean? You just was baptized. Water baptism. God doesn't have a Navy. But I was baptized and I joined the church. Because the reason why this is such a, a big thing upon the table of my heart is because we are three months into the year and we don't have any, I don't even hear discussion about salvation. Who are you working on? He said, but I can't say, but I know that, but you can help the Lord win them. He said, does the Lord need help? He's made it a requirement. He that winneth souls, that you are wise. Who do you have? Some of you, you've isolated yourself from everyone so that you don't have to do this. Y'all know we couldn't do that when we was growing up. Me, mom, and grandpa, and all them, you had to get out there and get to work. And if you was little, you did the little things. If you were 
older, you did the bigger things. But in the church, we can hide behind our homes. And, and, and we, have, we can't. It's, it's revealing to me something is wrong somewhere. And if, if we can just allow the world to go to hell in a handbasket and say God is going to sort all of that business out, is Christ in you of a truth? This woman joined the church after she was saved. We have folk who have joined the church and didn't get saved. They got the, as someone has said, the cart before the horse, but no, really, they, they got the horse in the cart. And most of the people I know, they're basing on something that they did as opposed to hearing the gospel and responding through obedience, through repentance, and faith toward God through Jesus Christ. That's why if you hear, you don't have no interest in those being saved because you are not saved if you have no interest. Praying for your family and loved ones. We are honored to do it. We are privileged to do it. But we trust that you are living before them as a living epistle. To be read amongst your children, your family, and friends. Because God wants them all saved. He wants all of them saved. I want to lay something on your heart. We are the descendants of those who rode the ark. God saved eight souls. And specifically for those who are gathered right now in this room, Ham would be one of Noah's sons. So when Ham reached the peaceful shores after the Rain had subsided. That's when we reached the peaceful shores. Okay, let me, let me try it this way. In doing my DNA to find out who my father is, I found out that I am, for the most part, Nigerian. Well, you know Nigeria is not over here. So when my foreparents came over here, specifically my father, father and father and father and father, I came here. So God saved eight souls. And that's why I know he wants to save the whole world. Is because he saved eight. And then out of those eight souls. And specifically Shem, Ham, and Japheth. We have all, every person accounted for. Now. Wouldn't it be a shame to have been, and I don't want to use the word saved in a, you know, being saved in salvation sense, but saved from the judgment of God in the ark of the Lord because it was never Noah's ark. See, that's the problem we have. We think it was Noah's ark like we think, pastor think that this is his church or they think that this is our church. It's Christ's church. If it's anyone's church. That he, he would save them on the ark of the Lord. Who closed them up in the ark of the Lord. To have their descendants to populate the whole earth. That we would have an opportunity to do this. Because I know what somebody out there is saying out there in social media land. He said, well, if I had been back there, I would have got on the ark. Well, you weren't back there. So then you didn't get on the ark. But now what you can do, you can get in Christ, who is the Lord of the ark. That's why he's saying, come unto me. He is the ark. Do you want to know how many people warm pews that have yet to come to Jesus Christ? Because few means few. It's not because God. Didn't send his son. Few means few. It doesn't mean that God didn't love the world. Few means few. It doesn't mean that Christ did not die for the sins of the world. <coughs> Who are you witnessing to? Who's on your radar? 
You feel me, Pastor? Right through this season, I, I'm, I'm just, I haven't been doing what I should do. All right, well, let's get with it. But are you sure the reason why you haven't been doing what you need to do is because it's not in you to do? And we don't expect you to do it. That, that's the beauty of this. You can get right like that lady last week got right with God. Not because of what mama did, daddy did, this person did, and what God did. No, it's what he did for me. He saved my old ashy soul. And you have an experience with him. So I see the method more so of the church through the apostles going forward, not asking the question when they arrive upon a group of people that had never heard the gospel, even for those who perhaps had not to ask them, are you saved? That should be a conversation that God starts with the sinner when God approves of the man who's preaching the gospel or even the woman who's giving her testimony and she's teaching a Sunday school class and she's in a place where the scriptures say she can operate and the Holy Ghost is upon and in these workers in Christ. And they do this. Peter said this, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He said, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved among you. God approved him. How? By wonders and miracles and signs, which God did by him. He said, ye yourselves know that by the determinate counsel and full knowledge of God, You've taken, and by wicked hands, you have crucified and slain. But God raised him from the dead. That's the gospel. This Jesus that God raised from the dead. And Peter went on to say, and where are we are witnesses? So therefore let all of the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made that the same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And Peter went on in his message to the point where those that were assembled, they said, men and brethren, what must we do? What happened? They became pricked in the heart. Some of you sitting here, you have yet to become pricked in your heart by the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ because you figured that's past me because I've already joined the church. I've already done all these things. But you're not in your station when it comes to being on, as they said, the battlefield for the Lord, being a good soldier, giving out the word of God. For those of you, your friends call you on the phone. When was the last time you shared the gospel? When was the last time that you walked outside and looked around and said, Lord, lead me into an appointment today that I might share the gospel? Had the occasion on yesterday to, to do just that with someone in the community, in the neighborhood. I walked up to him and I said, can I, can I just speak with you? And if he said, no, I don't have time, that's good. You want to be on God's time. I asked him, I said, since I've been your neighbor and been in this neighborhood, do you know me to have ever taken anything from you? Lied to you. Well then, what I'm getting ready to say, now if you are a man of chance, it could be that you might be starting a lie pattern. But I want to let you know what I'm getting ready to set before you is the gospel of Jesus Christ. How that Christ died for your sin. You don't need a thousand scriptures. Christ died for your sins. The application is Christ died for your sin. You. Scripture will make his own gravy. And not only did he die, but he was buried. So we know he was dead. The Spirit of God verified that. He wasn't swooned. Died and, you know, or he wasn't. 
you know, technically he wasn't dead. He was dead because Christ gave up the ghost. And he was buried. And he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now you're going to have to deal with what God did because of your sin. And the only way to meet God on a firm foundation is to meet him at Calvary's cross so to speak, or through repentance to realize that you are a sinner and you need to be saved. And Jesus Christ is the only all-sufficient Savior. I didn't ask him, are you saved? Now I was hoping what would come out of that is that he would respond by saying, what must I do to be saved? Here in Acts 16, and we will try to work through this uh, by reading Acts 16 and verse 20. Now, Paul and Silas, they're in Philippi. They, when they came in, they saw a gathering of women, and then Paul started to talk with them. And you know what he was talking about. It wasn't small talk the whole time. He shared the gospel. Lydia heard. Lydia was saved. Then he went on and then came across this young damsel who had a spirit of divination. And Paul dealt with that by casting that spirit out of her. In verse 20, let's pick it up in verse 19. And when her master saw that the hope of their gain was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs, and underscore teach customs, that's the, that's the gospel, which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed, sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And then you know what happened next. So that was an earthquake. Now, when the earthquake occurred, the doors of the prison opened. And the prisoners were loosed. No one left. In verse 28 or 27, the latter part, the prison guard or the, the keeper, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice saying, do thyself no harm for we are all here. Then he called for a light, sprang in, came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas, and brought them out and said, Sir, what must I do to be saved? Why is he asking the question? He heard them praying in their cell. And he heard them praying. But also, in verse 20, he also got wind of the message that Paul and them was preaching. And it was something that they could not receive, though it was a custom, they perceived it to be a custom that Paul and Silas had. And they heard them preach the gospel. What must I do to be saved, saved from what? Listen at what Paul and Silas said. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. So somewhere along the way, this man was brought into a dialogue with God concerning his own spiritual condition that he needed a savior. 
and Jesus Christ could save. You say, well, we see believe here, but we don't see repentance here. Listen, listen to verse 32. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord. See, we don't have everything that he said, but we do know that the apostle Paul spoke the word of the Lord. In other words, it was along these lines as it is in Acts chapter 26. When Paul said in verse 19, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea, and then to the Gentiles. Paul, what did you show the Gentiles after you were saved, after you were sent up by Christ, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance? I believe that one of the issues we have in this day and time is that we have gotten in the way of the Spirit of God bringing sinners before God that they might see themselves without Christ, see themselves dead in trespasses and in sin and lost in darkness. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for these moments in which we have shared. And you know the burden that has been upon my heart for years. And that is to see this great mission field where both sinners and saints assemble. And in some places, that's no more than a community center involved in everything under the sun except the true work of the church. But it's been the burden upon my heart that they'd be reached with the gospel. That they'd come forth as this lady did down in Florida and came out of darkness and into the marvelous light. But she was saved. And then she took upon her the, one of the two ordinances is that she would baptize in water. So we thank you, Lord, for what you shared with us. I'm praying that it be not only insightful, but someone under the sound of my voice will come on Salvation Sunday, which is every Sunday, every day of the week, and surrender their will to the will that I am. We thank you. We give you praise. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. Any questions about...